Uh, our next speaker, um, you may see in some of the images that are projected up here, uh, circa 1968, Ricardo. And um, he was a graduate student at UCLA in 1968 and a member of BUMAS, UCLA, and a participant in all, uh, all these activities that occurred. Uh, as part of the walkouts. Professor Juan Gomez Quinones. We've uh, prepared a uh, paper with, with multiple uh, co-authors and presenters. Uh, Irene Vasquez from UNM um, and ourselves from uh, uh, UCLA. So, um, Carlos has uh, rightfully insisted, and we all share that uh, conviction, that the emphasis should be on uh, the high school uh, students um, because in fact they were the the motor for uh, for history and we have sought to abide uh, with that uh, premise <clears throat> he also at least to me and maybe to uh, others that uh, in the case of our presentation we should in turn emphasize the participation of uh, college students. So keeping that in mind and knowing that you're going to hear various perspectives with uh, a variety of supporting facts concerning um, the um, movement of the blowouts and the efforts of uh, uh, directed at reform uh, there will be uh, overlaps, and that's uh, in some ways to um, the good in the sense that maybe uh, we will be that much more encouraged to reflect on uh, the different facts and the different uh, perspectives. Uh, Elizabeth Gonzalez uh, will uh, present the introduction, and I will make the closing uh, remarks. So Elizabeth, a graduate of UCLA, a doctoral student of the School of Education here, and now um, a classroom teacher, like those she writes about in the classrooms that uh, she speaks to. And also, as we know and remember from uh, times past, uh, an activist in her own right. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Okay, so the Chicana, Chicano student movement of the 1960s and 1970s formed part of waves of widespread political revival among youth and other sectors in the United States. Assessing these social movement activities is formative to understanding the distribution and application of public power, as well as documenting the importance of youth vanguards in challenging racism and discrimination in the U.S. An exploration of the student walkouts or blowouts offer a seminal assessment in understanding the impact of human agency and storytelling in educational institutions. However, limited public knowledge of the walkouts remain in the larger society. The tallying and retelling of high school activism in the greater East Los Angeles area has consequential impact on the possibilities for instituting education and civic transformation to better serve students of color. In the 1960s, Mexican parents and students continually demonstrated dissatisfaction with an education system believed to perpetuate the subordinate status of Mexican people. For generations, parents had repeatedly sought positive responses from schools and school boards. Historically, the public education system provided 
One means of exercising cultural and eth ethnic subordination of Mexicans in the United States. Mexican American families and groups critiqued with few positive results, educational inequities and school malpractices. Nevertheless, some favorable court case rulings in California, Arizona, and Texas occurred on behalf of Mexican Americans. In fact, these Mexican American cases served as precedents, pre precedents for the widely recognized Brown versus Board of Education 1954 case, which ended black white segregation. It did not. Actually, segregation continued for years. Furthermore, the Brown case did not address inequalities of funding, teaching, or access to materials, or for that matter, integration. Mexican-American concerns went beyond integrating student attendance at quality schools, which in practice meant busing black or brown students to white schools, or in some cases, busing brown students to black schools, and in other cases, busing black students to brown schools. When Mexican-American efforts succeeded, it was not because of Brown versus Board of Education, but in spite of it. The Brown decision made one difference. The liberal public came to think of education reform as Black-focused, stressing busing and later Black administrators. In any case, parallel to legal educational reform, Chicana Chicano youth activists eventually identified what needed to be changed, the culture and institutionalization of education. Transformation of education structures would not result from busing and not for a long time. Thank you. Both um, Mario Garcia and Elizabeth Gonzalez spoke to uh, uh, the, the blowouts, the walkouts in a variety of ways. And I do want to keep to my <clears throat> commitment to uh, Carlos. He reminded me as recently as the beginning of this week what it is that uh, I should uh, emphasize and I'm glad that uh, he did because actually I began thinking of other things um, <clears throat> and having the advantage that uh, Mario and Elizabeth has spoken uh, before me um, I will do what I was asked to do but also uh, maybe uh, add some different uh, ways of framing uh, the blowouts and uh, emphasizing uh, some aspects that are not as uh, worthy of rejoicing as might uh, be the case. And by that I'm referring to the pressures that um, uh, youth faced at that time. And you notice I used youth, not student. Um, youth, uh, high school students and college students that often is not as widely understood and the importance of it is not to um, underscore uh, the negative um, but rather to underscore the seriousness and the courage of uh, the students that uh, uh, participated and of course we're talking about an effort that involved thousands of students on their own of their own volition, with their own local leaders, in fact, going public, uh, voicing their concern and demanding uh, change. Uh, <clears throat> it doesn't uh, rob uh, anyone of uh, recognition, or for that matter, even patience, uh, to listen to uh, that uh, observation several times because Often in the course of our lives, we want other people to be 
doing things while we do uh, things pertinent to uh, to our own persons. And if we look at uh, even right now, without going back to history, and as was pointed out, there's a very rich history, and we can literally have thousands of graduate students working on uh, thousands of topics and never yet completely uh, exhausted. And the tremendous scholarship uh, birth and, and birthing that we have had has only touched the surface as a busy and as uh, excellent as it is in uh, uh, many ways. <clears throat> I want us to think of um, of youth, or I suggest that we think of uh, youth and to think of how um, youth acted in the 60s, uh, certainly uh, intensified uh, acting for a good period of uh, five years, uh, somewhat before the uh, origins of the movement and uh, much later after uh, the, um, the closure or shifting within the, uh, uh, the movement. Uh, we have to think of the youth in the neighborhoods um, that had no institutional access. Their realities was basically institutional oppression in the most uh, naked and direct ways, right? How is it that our youth at that time uh, came to uh, judge um, law enforcement uh, individuals and uh, agencies. What is it that they uh, saw and, and felt? Um, and they did see it and feel it in a particular way. Uh, if you grew up, and I noticed some people uh, are from the area, in uh, unincorporated, unincorporated East LA, how it is that the sheriffs behave towards our youth. Uh, how are they being reprimanded for some of the actions that they do, and now even their boards when they have one, and the sheriffs doesn't. Uh, but certainly uh, the recent sheriffs, um, and uh, perhaps some talking from the supervisors, and certainly attention by uh, judges uh, have concurred at the, not misconduct, the atrocious uh, conduct of law enforcement towards our youth. And what is, uh, and when it is mentioned, what is ever, what is overlooked is the fact that the worst mistreatment is directed at women. That didn't start, you know, this last month with this rogue sheriff officer doing uh, what he was doing vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the women uh, caught in the web of uh, enforcement. We also know that from the community youth, any number of groups uh, sprang forth. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, Brown Berets, and they get a certain amount of, uh, of recognition in the research uh, literature. It is, I think, important to note the obvious that they are a youth premise uh, organization in the community, um, neighborhoods, and uh, doings. That there was not only uh, high school students, which I'm going to talk about a bit more, or college students, which I could talk about even more, but I won't. Um, it is important to note that the stirrings of discontent and readiness to pick up the lance, to go on the offensive as opposed to being always on the defensive at the street level. That stems from uh, community youth who didn't go even to high school uh, and much less no EOP administrator came and offered them a ticket to uh, college. And that this participation, you know, consisted over time, uh, in a variety of activities, uh, <clears throat> often uh, acting on their own and often acting in accordance with the deep sense of uh, knowing that they have been dealt with 
unjust and knowing who it is that are their oppressors, their verdugos. Uh, some writers have caught that, maybe the late Armando Morales and certainly um, Roberto uh, Rodriguez, but I want to indicate to you that youth are going to participate in the other uh, aspects involving um, their, their uh, age uh, uh, mates. Uh, one might say that youth activity of a certain kind culminates in the topic that many people would not choose to talk about uh, because how it was viewed uh, in the press and in the media, right? And that is the demonstrations uh, following uh, the big apex of the movement locally, and that being the Chicano Moratorium of August uh, 29. Who participated in the demonstrations that uh, sought to even uh, the scores that uh, had been inflicted on our community uh, during the demobilization of the uh, August 29th uh, mobilization. And you're not gonna see too many faculty out there uh, or others of um, the lower middle class. In those demonstrations, it was basically community uh, youth that in a very direct and absolute way said, ya basta y mas. Right. Uh, we know what uh, that uh, series of sets uh, culminated in, and that is that nearly all of uh, Los Angeles, including members of our community, uh, were disaffected with uh, um, the youth. At the same time, they drink beer and listen to corridos. Uh, they don't know that, uh, in fact, the hero heroic uh, play uh, very well may be by those youths that in the best way possible, completely unarmed, um, without resources, with uh, almost but not quite no organization taking on the military forces, which is what we know they are of the LAPD and um, the sheriffs. I want to point out that uh, community youth, of course, become part of uh, what led to the formation of the Brown uh, berets and the brown berets have their own history with any number of uh, punctuations and uh, uh, underscoring but we must think that the brown berets did not come out of the colleges in fact they did come out of the high schools um, and that that was a very important uh, youth effort right that in turn contributed in a variety of ways to uh, the campaigns of other uh, youth, sought to counsel and advise or recruit um, community youth, uh, certainly uh, sought to uh, uh, guide and monitor and protect the high school uh, students, and certainly uh, worked up energy to shide uh, college students when they got a little bit too uh, college. But we can trace the beginning of the Brown Berets from the roots and if you will, if you want to give them an institutional base, you would say Camp Cass Kramer because David Sanchez was there and probably uh, uh, others, but they certainly were part of an effort by um, the uh, <clears throat> mayor's office of uh, Los Angeles to have a youth council and that experience sort of uh, strengthen uh, their critical views vis-a-vis -vis that kind of orchestrated and uh, subjugated uh, youth monitoring uh, was. They certainly were the, at the beginning of uh, what came to be the rudimentary skeletal organization of uh, the walkouts. Uh, I would not say that they were the leaders simply because I see with great conviction that the leaders were the high school students themselves. But nonetheless, uh, the Brown Berets um, were there. Uh, and if we look at who in particular law enforcement or the district attorney's office uh, singled out for their special attention, uh, you notice that uh, the Brown Beret mem members 
uh, active in the Wack House received a little bit more attention than um, others. The college students, uh, actually not great in number, began um, their organizing, at, in, in part inspired by what other youth uh, were doing uh, within their insight. Uh, whether uh, it was their attendance at Camp Cat Scramer, when some of the youth went uh, in one direction and the other uh, uh, left of uh, them, uh, but certainly in the formation of uh, a variety of groups that came together under the umbrella uh, and unified designation of uh, the United Mexican American um, students. And we can see the fact that uh, the youth that I have subdivided and enumerated, community, uh, high school, and college, at different important uh, critical moments, uh, cooperated and uh, supported each other. To be sure, there were differences. If you get two Chicanas or two Chicanos together, we all know it's going to be at least three opinions. And that's actually good, you know. That's, that goes beyond the nonsense of participatory democracy when they don't let you participate, right? Um, but <clears throat> And the cooperation, uh, to hasten my... my uh, uh, remarks uh, is very evident again during the walkouts. Uh, you can see it in the photographs, different kinds of students. If you went to the Audrey uh, exhibit, uh, however it is one might uh, judge it, it certainly is uh, on the worthwhile spot, um, a pictorial record of individuals and uh, uh, participations that we would not be able to see uh, quite so um, clearly and well as was done by the simple act of putting photographs in uh, on the wall. On the other hand, there's no context uh, to that. But at the very least, we have uh, the photographs and we have photographs here. And the center at UCLA has taken a lead role in what I understand and how to part of a very complicated process of making those photographs, which number in the thousands, um, which is part of our visual heritage, uh, available. And that legacy now is going to, is being made uh, uh, permanent through the efforts of the Chicano Studies Center, and certainly, of course, with the efforts of the photographers, because without them we wouldn't have the uh, photography. If we think of, um, let's say, Let's look at, um, and I know there's at least one person here that was involved. If we look at what happened at the Biltmore Hotel that uh, the media, uh, led by the LA Times, of course, so uh, uh, thoroughly uh, disreported. Uh, we see uh, college youth, we see brown berets, we see high school students, and we see community um activity and that just sharp very clear singular historical epi episode and that is the chicano protest at the biltmore i am particularly thinking of the protests led by uh college students but in the presence of other uh youth um that uh put the spotlight on the negatives of Governor Ronald Reagan. In your face, confrontation uh, with the governor that we all know was so negative in so many ways and ended up being a foundational figure in the development of the current extreme right uh, in the United States. I mean, who confronted Ronald Reagan face to face, and then uh, have to deal with uh, the consequences. Um, <clears throat> I can name uh, the names, and maybe I will, because one of them just stepped out. Uh, Adelaide del Castillo, uh, Reynaldo Macias, um, Luis uh, Arroyo. And they, of course, immediately got arrested, and all kinds of 
uh, threats were directed uh, at them as a result of that. That took place sometime roughly at noon. And we know in the afternoon um, there was this brouhaha um, still centering uh, on what was taking place by uh, conservatives and Republicans at the Biltmore on that day with Ronald Reagan as um, uh, the guest of honor and principal speaker, one would say chief ideologue. Uh, and that is uh, the allegations that they were out to uh, subvert the conference by physical means of one kind or another. We, of course, know, and the judges have agreed that the ones who actually moved the Morris Dream Actors was an undercover police, right? um, which is why all the people, if I'm correct, uh, eventually, despite the long-term uh, um, um, what uh, undercover activities of Carlos Montes on behalf of his own freedom, uh, but all individuals uh, eventually were exonerated in one way or the other uh, from the allegations that they were seeking to do uh, action that might uh, result in uh, severe damage to the hotel and uh, perhaps... Uh, uh, make apprehensive the people attending the conference. They were there to protest the conference. And you do have brown berets and you do have community uh, students, youth, uh, engaged in that. And I'm just picking something out of the blue. We also know what often is not reported in the literature is that there's an undercover person. You might ask, why is an undercover person there? And it is the undercover person as the court pointed out, that was in fact the prime uh, mover. Uh, our youth, whether from the community, from the colleges, from the berets, were there to uh, protest because that was the only way they were going to get the uh, attention uh, from uh, the attendees at the Nueva Vistas uh, conference that I taught. If we go uh, to uh, the very dramatic and also historical and now iconic August 29, 1970. Uh, who are the organizers? Who are uh, the doers, the workers? Uh, who are the masses of participants that we can see in photographs and in free? Uh, and by the way, heavily attended by uh, women. Uh, the participants that gave that massive um, density to uh, August 29th events uh, were in fact uh, youth, along with many others, and certainly elder citizens, because those too can be seen in uh, the photographs and films, and certainly involving uh, many, a whole, many other people in a range of, uh, of uh, commitments and ideological uh, beliefs, not just simply Chicano or uh, Mexicano. Uh, if we look at something that's going to have a far uh, longer life and has been very dramatic, uh, has been the immigrant rights uh, movement. And though I am skipping beyond uh, the framework that I impose of myself, the chronological framework of three or five years, uh, who has led most aggressively, uh, most uh, ideologically innovative, if it's not been immigrant youth themselves, making uh, the plight and right of uh, immigrants, you know, uh, in ways that hadn't been done before, even though we have a super long history with many outstanding figures uh, in the immigrant right uh, struggle. The DACA movement uh, is indeed, uh, in its beginnings, uh, a primarily uh, youth uh, movement. <clears throat> so we're looking at high school students. I'm supposed to be talking about what uh, college students did to support. And I will agree very emphatically on one aspect. The college students were supportive elements. Uh, the doers and speakers were the high school uh, students uh, themselves. Uh, but to keep my word, I can 
state many of the things that uh, were uh, very well spoken to by uh, Professor Mario Garcia and Professor Elizabeth uh, uh, Gonzalez. I will go over some of them just to show you uh, what, while well, organizing, as most of the people in this room know, because I would guess many of you have participated in uh, organizing, and some of you, or many of you are, are organizers. Well, um, once the great trumpets sound, um, the tasks of organizing are rather mundane, right? And in fact, they're so mundane that they're usually uh, not uh, remarked on in the literature that seeks to be uh, more um, analytical. Um, I would point out, what did they do? Well, one was they supported uh, the high school students, uh, their animal, uh, keeping their morale up, uh, which was uh, so important. It came from the high school students themselves. That has to come from your heart, right? If you're going to engage, if you're going to participate, it has to come from your heart, right? But you, but you also need uh, support, right? We need support in all kinds of ways, especially moral, uh, when we're in uh, tight spots of our own uh, making. Uh, second, materials, whether it's leaflets, uh, whether it's uh, uh, graphics, as you see many of the posters, um, and other paraphernalia that give a character, give a stamp uh, to the mobilization. Uh, high school students being in class would not be able to bring in their leaflets, uh, their uh, carteles, uh, to, uh, to them with, uh, uh, with class. And college students were important in that aspect of organizing at a time and where even telephones weren't all that uh, available and certainly nothing akin to the communication technology that we have uh, now. <clears throat> Another way that they were supported, they spoke to parents and um, both speakers, I believe, alluded to the fact that uh, Sal um, was active in that regard and certainly was active in speaking to students beyond uh, Lincoln or Roosevelt or Wilson and Garfield schools closest to um, the uh, youth constituency that he was particularly uh, emphatic uh, about. Without gaining saying that as we know, walkout took place across uh, LA uh, County, uh, inspired by the walkouts of the schools that I just um, mentioned. Um, <clears throat> but with students come parents, come elders, and there is also this uh, element of sort of self-styled uh, leadership, which every once in a while sort of bucked, and instead of giving a smooth ride, uh, tried to throw off the uh, protesters and demonstrators, the activists, the frontline fighters of um, the saddle. And somebody had to uh, speak to them, and they were usually not a friendly uh, group or audience. Uh, to talk to, and some of their unfriendliness will pop up in uh, different ways behind closed doors, by the way, also something that is not often uh, covered in the literature. Um, being part, first I should say, setting up and being part of uh, network, telephone networks, telephone trees, to use that, that, uh, that sort of, what, uh, native or inoperative uh, uh, comparison. It was more than a tree. It was like a forest way of people being able to communicate in uh, uh, different ways and to be able to do so instantly right? via the old telephone way. Somebody had to do that work. Again, high school students in class, in yards, were not able uh, to do that. They got uh, very busy after they walked out on telephones, but not so much while they were um, in a uh, um, uh, classroom. They were visible supporters at a time when some people were shying away 
from from uh, walkouts, not wanting to be uh, during the marches, not even wanting to be at some of the meetings. The college students made their presence felt, and that gave not only anima, which I remarked upon, but it also communicated to other people, hey, uh, let's go with it. Sometimes when organizing has been successful, uh, we don't remember the times that uh, uh, in the process at the beginning, if you call for a meeting, and about two people would show up, right? And one of them would leave early. Uh, you've got to do a lot of work to get hundreds and certainly to get thousands, which, by the way, the high school students did uh, achieve, but they did so also with uh, support. Uh -huh. I think they're particularly helpful as the marches out of the schools took place, given what I just said right now, that is the absence of others, they were there at the gates. They were there uh, literally holding hands as students walked down. Uh, they were there walking alongside, not guiding, walking alongside and trying to keep up with uh, the high school students trying to find uh, safe places to gather, given all the stuff that's coming down on them, for example, uh, walking to Hazard, uh, walking to Evergreen, uh, walking to uh, whatever. Uh, you see the college students there uh, locking arms and walking with them. And in often cases, speaking to administrators who would come to the gates, they didn't come into the march, but they did go to the gates, right? Uh, and you see some of that in some of the films. And of course, the police who, especially the LAPD, who will eventually lose the leadership to the sheriffs in brutality, uh, were particularly onerous uh, on the students. We didn't have uh, dozens of ACLU people. We didn't have um, dozens of r recently graduated law school uh, uh, persons, which we had and eventually uh, some of those came and some of those behaved uh, very well, but in the absence of that kind of professional, um, um, if not quite uh, monitoring, but at least accompanying, was supplied by the students. And again, to repeat, you can see it in um, the, for the photographs. And some, some of them took uh, hits and one or two I think were uh, arrested or haragued for some reason amongst many others. I can think of Luis Carrillo uh, being one, um, maybe Al Juarez. Um, <clears throat> we also know that uh, the persons of uh, La Raza, um, not La Raza of later uh, reincarnations, but La Raza of Eliseo Risco, uh, Ruth Robinson, who seems to be erased from Chicano history, Guadalupe Saavedra, they took the brunt of what the police were willing to do. If you think they acted badly in the walkouts of 71 at Roosevelt, you should have seen what they were doing during the 68 uh, walkouts. Uh, and you can see the photograph of how they attacked Ruth uh, attacked uh, Guadalupe uh, on the street, you know, and did the number that made them famous in uh, the uh, uh, 92 case of uh, the African American man, right? Uh, once spontaneous, more openly uh, meetings, uh, spontaneous but nonetheless more open meetings by students prior to those meetings to the marches and the walkouts themselves. College students uh, attended those meetings and uh, if asked to, uh, they spoke. And that was an important uh, process and a concrete gathering, uh, arm in arm, side by side of college and uh, uh, university uh, students and community students. Uh, uh, certainly the Brown Berets are going to be there. Um, they certainly are going to be active in calls for demonstrations, uh, going to uh, the sheriffs or uh, the police uh, headquarters. Um, they're very important 
in providing support to high school students via the early beginnings of the EICC, which seems to be another uh, punto that gets uh, erased, right? It's sort of uh, from, from the movement uh, uh, photograph. We can say that it wasn't just Vahak Mardarosian, um, thankful in what he did, but it was a group of parents asking Vahak Mardarosian accompanied by some students who weren't allowed to be in the hallway, uh, when these people uh, went to speak uh, to uh, administrators for the first time. Uh, it's a different thing from having a, a, uh, a large demonstration at Hazard uh, with uh, Dr. Nava and others uh, present in the back, and you have a college student speaking at the, night, at the microphone uh, next to a high school uh, a student. Uh, this is thorough and continuous uh, support at meetings at the board and through EICC. EICC, Educational Issues Coordinating Committee, began by a group of about four or five parents, plus Fahak, and then larger numbers of uh, students um, came into um, the play. Uh, we know, and you can check the photographs on that, uh, that the sit-ins, the demonstrations at the board, proceeded by making uh, presentations there at, uh, at the LA Unified School District uh, uh, headquarters, uh, while they were still letting, having meetings and letting us attend. Uh, the majority of the people there are going to be uh, college students, university students, and uh, community uh, youth, right? And that was important uh, because being able to go to those meetings for a parent meant that you had to take off work and that was not so easy, and many did, right? Uh, but certainly when you look at those meetings and you see in the photograph that came out both earlier in the week and, and today of a high school student speaking to the mic directly to board members, if you could uh, identify the fuzzy uh, photograph, right? They rightfully uh, underscored photographically the high school speaker, uh, but in the background, um, you have uh, the kind of assembly of folks that you would have at those meetings. And surprising, at least to me, you know, uh, a lot of women and a lot of youth, uh, right, at those. Uh, meetings. And lastly, uh, one has to commend the college students uh, for sticking through to the process of uh, advocacy and demands and direct actions. For example, the takeover of the Board of Education, you know, which lasted uh, several days and of which there's a lot of um, photographs. Um, the 35 or so people that were arrested at that uh, demonstration when the board finally moved to uh, evict the uh, sit-inners uh, were uh, students. But that also led to the safeguarding of uh, Sal Castro's uh, tenure as a teacher. The removing of him from uh, the teaching potion podium would have been a very severe uh, blow to us and also a loss to his access to students. And I think of those protests being primarily done by youth. Again, youth of uh, a variety of, uh, of backgrounds. Um, I come to a close and I can repeat some of the things that were done very well by, or spoken very well by Elizabeth and Mario, that is the, the larger picture. Uh, and to get across, I don't, I don't know where this idea that the blowouts didn't accomplish came up. I have to ask, is this a friend who's saying that? Um, I don't know. Uh, but the fact is tremendous changes took place and we ought to underscore that. One, because they are factually true 
Secondly, why are we in the business of de-animando ourselves, of demoralizing us? Oh, we did the biggest high school demonstration in the history of the United States, and we got nothing. <laughs> uh, in fact, a lot of changes took place, and they were directly related to what the high school students did by that very dramatic history-making action. Right? The students, the high school students, made history, right? To be sure, there is, you know, an encyclopedia of multiple volumes uh, that has our, our, our history. Uh, but these students are uh, remarkable, right? To get across just a little bit of the seriousness, and I know I'm beginning to exhaust your... your um, your patience, and I better have it here, right? Um, that'd be funny if I did. Oh, okay. Basically, what I wanted to uh, read to you uh, was a memo by uh, uh, the beloved leader of uh, the FBI, uh, Edgar Hoover, uh, published before uh, the walkouts, uh, in fact, months before, if I'm not uh, mistaken, and I, uh, I'm sorry that I don't have uh, the, uh, the copy. Oh, you lucked out. Um, sometimes the Verdugos... Uh, hang themselves on their own petard. Um, this is a memo, direct memo, and they weren't always all that uh, comma, calling for emphatic proactive action against who? Uh, against some of the students that I've been talking about. Signed by Edgar Hoover and directed, distributed address to all the offices of the FBI. I, I write, I, I read the writing. Uh, there has been a recent rise in the formation of various Mexican-American organizations, mostly throughout the southwestern part of the United States. While they all originate with a purpose of bettering the educational, economic, and general stature of the Mexican-Americans, Experience, I guess his, has shown that these organizations do become more militant. This is the concern of the FBI uh, executive director. More militant and aggressive as time goes on. Well, he got that right. Uh, certain organizations are coming under communist influence Communist input, and are holding classes in Marxist Leninist ideology. They don't have a uh, education, uh, but they're attending uh, classes on on theory, I guess. Huh? Um, others, dot dot dot, are arming themselves and holding classes in weaponry. Who has all the weapons? You know. <laughs> um, Others have tried to, oh, this is terrible, have tried to align themselves or cooperate in activities of the Black Panther Party. Wow. Um, your investigation of the UMAS should be penetrative and receive aggressive attention. Signed, J. Edgar Cuban, directed to our youth. Uh, I'll close with something um, maybe a little bit more romantic uh, and maybe will uh, keep us from being uh, too arrogant, even though a certain amount of arrogance is you need it, you know. <clears throat> it's a poem uh, from the Aztecs. Uh, we live here on the earth. We are all fruits of the earth. The earth sustains us. We grow here on the earth and flower, 
and when we die, we wither in the earth. We are all fruits of the earth. We eat of the earth, and then the earth eats us. So uh, it's a somber statement, so we don't get too uh, heady with uh, ourselves. And it does come from a literary tradition that's a lot older than J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> All right. We're going to prepare for our next speaker, uh, Professor Dolores Delgado Bernal. And uh, uh, in reference to some of the images that uh, 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 Professor Gomez re re talked about, uh, there are thousands and thousands of images in La Raza a collection here, in Chicano Student News, and also in um, the uh, Oscar Castillo collection. We have an exhibit up at the center in Haynes Hall that we'll all be able to visit uh, after we finish with the conference today. Uh, and we'll walk up and we'll take a tour of the exhibit. Today will be the opening day of the exhibit, formally opening the exhibit. The exhibit has uh, images from 1968 of the walkouts. Uh, images that were taken by Deborah Weber, uh, who's here with us today. And uh, those images show what occurred at Roosevelt High School. Then we have images that show us what happened at the sit-in at the uh, uh, Alley Unified School District Board offices, the conference room. And then we have images in the hallway of Haynes Hall uh, that... Uh, are on Sal Castro and the movement to reinstate Sal Castro. So those are in the hallway. And uh, uh, the, the last images uh, are of the East LA 13. So uh, these are com uh, uh, thematic uh, uh, components of the exhibit and the exhibit will be up at the center uh, probably through September. So uh, you'll have an opportunity to see those images. And uh, then we have one more group, and it's of the forgotten uh, walkouts that occurred. Uh, two years after the walkouts, Roosevelt once again walked out. And it was uh, uh, the students attending Roosevelt, some of whom had participated in the walkouts a few years earlier, who were frustrated with uh, the inaction of the school board in attending to the demands that were submitted in 1968. So we had a second walkout, but very few people know about that walkout. Fortunately, Oscar Castillo uh, uh, was a, in attendance at that uh, walkout and took uh, a number of images. Some of them are even in color, so they'll be a little different. And uh, what we're fortunate in seeing with Oscar's collection, and his collection is here at UCLA, his images also underscore that women were at the forefront of the Roosevelt walkout. They led throughout, and the images show this. They show Chicanas walking in front, not in the back, but in front. And uh, it, those images distinguish uh, from what happened in 68. They really do. They, they're visual and they impress. Uh, well, they're very impressive. They, they will show uh, the continuation of not only student but community action because there were parents involved in the 1970 walkouts as well. Buenos dias. 
I realize I am the only thing between you and lunch. So I want to make sure we're all here. You're still with me. Can we start off with a Chicano clap? Viva la gente! So let me start off by thanking Dr. Carlos Otto for um, putting this significant event together, being a part of all the events that are going on throughout um, the city last week and this week. Um, also to his team, um, I know Johnny and um, uh, Bryant both um, helping him put this together. I also on a personal note want to thank him because the invitation um, allowed me or he encouraged me to revisit my dissertation data from um, two and a half decades ago. And so going back to that was very, very important for me. Um, as a doctoral student, one of um, Dr. Daniel Solorzano's first doctoral students, I interviewed eight women who were participants in the blowouts um, along with um, Sal Castro. And I was interested in decolonizing the history of the blowouts by uncovering women's voices um, and their unique experiences that really had been omitted from what I had read, what I had heard. And in fact, when I decided to do my dissertation, there was um, a colega, another doctoral student um, from the 68 generation, and I was saying what I was going to do. And he said, you know, that sounds, that sounds really interesting. Um, you know, it's going to be tough because women really weren't that involved. They, they weren't the leaders. Despite that, my chair said, no, you need to do this. He gave me the name of one woman, um, Celeste Baca, and said, you should contact her. And I have to tell you what was really interesting in interviewing these women, and there were more, but um, you got to finish a dissertation, right? So I focused on eight women. Um, but what was really interesting is when I went to Celeste Baca, she said, oh, I'd be happy to talk to you, but really, I wasn't a leader. You should talk to uh, Tanya Luna Mount. And I went and called Tana. Tanya, got a hold of her. Oh, happy to talk to you, but really, I wasn't a leader. You should talk to Vicky Castro. Called Vicky Castro, and Vicky Castro said the same thing about Paula Crisostimo on down the line. Every single one of them who, as young girls didn't consider themselves leaders and yet when i interviewed them i interviewed them in 1995 and 1996 so um about um over 25 years past the time of their participation in 68. as part of the walkouts i um this anniversary i revisited the women's voices the stories they're what um are called counter memories literally listening to old vhs tapes which have now been digitized, um, little micro cassette tapes, um, listening to those really, really poor quality, glad we have everything digital now. Um, and Meili Backwell calls counter memories those fragments of histories that create space for women and historical traditions that erase them by colonial practices or masculinist renderings of history that disappear women's political involvement. So in the past with my dissertation and, and, and early, you know, writing from the dissertation, I looked at how these counter memories inform the notion of transformational resistance along with um, grassroots leadership, thinking about it in a different way. But I believe their counter memories also allow us to understand what nurtured their activist imaginations. And I think that has implications for young activists today. So I draw from their counter, memory, counter memories to focus on how their activism was inspired by three things. Their parents, especially mothers, transformational mentors, some have already been mentioned, some of those mentors already mentioned today, and what Emma Perez calls sitios de lenguas. Well, there's a number of other factors clearly that shape their participation. I believe that understanding these three factors have direct implications for how we support and nurture student activism today. So for the next um, 30 minutes or so, um, I have a, a twofold purpose. One, I really want to introduce some of you or reintroduce for some of you um, these women from 1968, these student leaders. And I want to at least, second, to at least briefly point to what the implications of their activism are for our youth today. And we've heard some of those implications already. So let me... 
as I said, I interviewed them in um, 1996 at Self Help Graphics. So I interviewed them individually and then I brought them together in a focus group. Uh, I want to allow them to introduce themselves and then what I'll do is actually offer brief snapshots of who they were at the time of their activism in 1968. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, I, really what I want to point to and that is pointing to their parents, again, especially mothers as um, motivating, um, influencing their consciousness. So let me start with their own introduction. Again, um, it's been digitized. I had a student put the captions because the sound is not great. Oops, that did not do it. So again, that's their own introduction in 1996. Let me introduce you to each of them um, back in 1968 based on the interviews they, they um, shared with me. In 1968, Paula Crisostimo was a senior at Lincoln High School. She felt both her gender and class, coupled with her mother's community work, influenced her early community involvement. Paula grew up in a traditional family of eight children with a Mexican mother and a Filipino father. Paula's mother was a full-time mother, wife, and community activist who was involved in parent groups, school-related activities, and various community projects. Her father, the breadwinner of the family, was not involved in community in the same way that her mother was. Living in a working class neighborhood, there were few after school youth programs at the time, and because she was female, Paula's mother wanted to, quote, keep a close eye on her. As a result, Paula participated in numerous community activities at her mother's side. Paula described the night before the walkout at Lincoln, and it's different than in the movie. There's clearly lots of changes in the, the uh, walkout movie. She says, I remember getting the phone call at night and hearing, Okay, all the schools are on it. Make your call. And I told my mother right away, and she said, Okay, I'll be there. I'll walk out. I'll take the bus from work, and I'll be in front of the school to wait for you. In the movie, she's surprised that her mom's there, but she did tell her mom, and her mom planned on being there to support her. Paula stated that her, her mother's community involvement and personal support were key to her participation in the school blowouts. Tanya Luna Mount grew up in a politically progressive family in which community activism was the norm and discussions of social justice topics were frequent. With a Mexican mother and white father, Tanya, her three siblings, and her parents confronted and dealt with racism frequently. As a result of her parents' mixed marriage, Tanya remembered her parents discussing and addressing issues of racism, classism, and oppression very openly with her and her siblings. Both her parents, Julia Luna Mount and George Mount, had a long history of community activism dating back to the late 1930s and early 1940s. In 1939, Julia, her mother, was involved in a labor resistance movement at one of Los Angeles' largest food processing plants that included a massive walkout and a 24-hour picket line to end deplorable working conditions. Our colega Vicky Ruiz writes about this. Her parents also had early involvement in the Black Civil Rights Movement, the Mexican-American Political Association, the Peace and Freedom Party, the Raza Unida Party, and organizing against police brutality and for improved health care. As a young child, Tanya attended rallies and meetings with her parents. She said, quote, and what I was organizing way before the walkouts was the anti-war movement at Roosevelt because I used to belong to the Students for a Democratic Society. I tried to organize a lot against police brutality. She concluded that her acute awareness and understanding of the issues related to the blowouts was influenced by her early upbringing. Mita Cuaron grew up in a family of mixed ethnicity with a long history of community activism also. With a Mexican father and Jewish mother, Mita and her three siblings were raised neither Catholic nor Jewish. 
Her parents were both involved in politically progressive activities, and she said she was shaped by the fact that she was, quote, born into this family of struggle, of protest, of rebellion, of champion of equal rights. Her father in particular helped her embrace a greater awareness of both her Chicano cultural identity and the discrepancies of resources in their working class neighborhood. Mita remembered how various factors came together with his influence. Quote, well, my father is a long-term labor leader in the community from the 40s and even through the Zoot Suit stuff. So it was through him and working class values, working class neighborhood, and then going to these meetings. These were instrumental in formulating, crystallizing for me, the discrepancies in our community. Celeste Baca uh, spoke of how her awareness of social inequities was something she always recalls having because of her upbringing in a politically progressive family and her mother's ongoing activism. Though her parents divorced when she was seven years old, she remembers her parents' early political involvement in the black civil rights movement, the farm worker movement, anti-Vietnam war activities, pro-labor unions, and the community service organization. Her mother, Dolores Baca, was especially influential and a powerful woman. She was a spiritual woman, but she, uh, but she didn't like the Catholic Church. The extended family considered Dolores a radical, and com comments such as, what revolution is she starting now, were common. Celeste describes her mother as a real loca. Mother was a doer. If something had to be done, she was out there doing it. I mean, she was in the sit-ins at the Board of Education. As a young girl and an only child uh, uh, until she was 14 years old, Celeste recalls her mother always discussing and explaining to her how class and race was tied to inequities in society. By the time of the blowouts, Celeste had left her mother's home and was fairly independent. Yet when discussing her own involvement in the blowout, Celeste acknowledges that it was through her mother that she came to be aware and understand social injustices at an early age. Rosalinda Mendez Gonzalez, uh, graduated, uh, 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 a graduate of Lincoln and a freshman at Oxford Dental College during the blowout. In, in contrast to most of the other women, her family did not have a history of community activism. She grew up in a large Catholic family in which she does not remember anyone explaining issues or, so, or, or socioeconomic oppression to her. As a young girl, her parents spoke very little English and neither her mother nor father were ever involved in political movements. Her mother, a devout Catholic, was influential in instilling a strong sense of compassion. Rosalinda believes that her early Catholic upbringing in a Texas border town, combined with her mother's compassion for others, helped her to develop concern, empathy, and sympathy for others. As a result, she remembered her identification with the poor and oppressed so that even as a child, quote, all the inequities and injustice used to trouble me very much. She pointed out that she grew up poor, but not compared to people in Mexico that were really poor. Quote, and I remember that every time we go across the border, my mother always, always had money to give to the poor. So I remember learning from my mother compassion for people who were suffering and for people who were poor, especially for mothers and for little children. Vicky Castro commented on the positive influence her mother and her and, uh, had on her and mixed messages she received from both of her parents. Vicky was the only girl in a Catholic family of four. She grew up in a traditional family with a very strong and dominant father who expected her to get married and have children. Her dad was an inspiration through his strength and leadership, yet, she often, yet he often held traditional gender expectations and tried to place limitations on Vic, Vicky. Simultaneously, her two older brothers were always encouraging, supportive, and they urged Vicky to go on to college. When it came to her future, Vicky's mother had always given her the opposite mes message of her father. She encouraged Vicky not to rely on someone else to take care of her and told her she wanted to have her prepared to take care of herself in life. Though her mother was often neutral and neither encouraged nor discouraged her from being involved in social justice struggles, she remembers how her mother's early union work had positive influence specifically on her own blowout participation and more generally on her community activism. Quote, and my mother went to work in the garment industry. She supported her mother, her grandmother, and herself in the garment industry. She was a shop steward and a leader in the union. So I have real memories of being very young and on the picket line. The whole unionism in my mother was very, very strong for me. Rachel Ochoa grew up in a large Catholic family of 10 children, all of whom graduated from Roosevelt. In fact, her brother is, still, uh, is a Roosevelt teacher now. 
When discussing factors that motivated her to get involved in the blowouts, Rachel focuses on her involvement in Camp Hess Kramer, Young Citizens for Community Action, and Mayor Yorty's Youth Council, but does not discuss her mother or father as influential others. Though she is the only interview who did not name her parents' role in shaping her awareness of social and school inequities, she does name other influential persons, such as peers and adults with whom she interacted in extracurricular activities and organization. Her parents did not have a history of community activism, nor were they involved in the issues that Rachel found herself addressing. Yet their support came in the form of allowing her to, to participate in different extracurricular activities and organizations. In fact, before she moved away and went to college, she needed to have their participation to a, um, participate in Young Citizens for Community Action and other organizations. Rachel remembers that her parents granted her permission to participate in the YCCA because their admiration and respect for Vicky Castro, who was a few years older than Vicky. Vicky was involved in YCCA and would often pick Rachel up for meetings. Quote, I was allowed to participate in this because my parents loved Vicky Castro. Cassandra Zacarias participated, uh, uh, grew up in a female-headed household with a without a father and with a sister who was much younger. Cassandra remembers being very close to her mother and that her mother was extremely independent and had a feisty spirit. Though her mother did not have a history of community activism, she was very supportive of Cassandra's activism. Cassandra described an incident when her mother advocated on her behalf after Cassandra skipped school when Martin Luther King was killed. Quote, it was a big deal because we had just heard Martin Luther King was killed and we were photographed on TV. Then then my mom was called by the school. They said, we saw your daughter on TV and we're going to suspend her. And she said, no, my daughter's homesick. God, how cool of my mom. <laughs> the counter memories of these women demonstrate the importance of parents, especially mothers in the early development of these activist students' awareness of social um, uh, justice and equities. They acknowledge that it was primarily through their mother's community involvement, political action, or compassion for others that they first began to develop their consciousness. Today, there are scholars who point to critical race parenting, or critical race feminista parenting, as a practice that engages both parent and child in the process of teaching and learning about race and other inequities. It refers to the work of parents of color to convey to our children how and why the historic and systemic elimination of young people of color in the United States is not only tolerated, but actually rationalized. Parent crit's a new scholarly field, shortened to parent crit. It's a new scholarly field, yet as many of us in this room know, either from our own parents or from maybe from our parenting, and as these women point to in their counter memories, the practices of raising the consciousness around social inequities of children of color is not new. The practice of helping kids become woke is not new. Through the messages they received about gender roles, um, they were, and although they were sometimes contradictory and grounded in patriarchy, they always allowed the mothers modeled, encouraged, and at least allowed them to develop strong beliefs in social justice and a belief that individual efforts can create a more just society. Parents of color and indigenous parents in the U.S. have been engaged in the struggles of sharing knowledge about how to combat the cruelty of racism, patriarchy, and colonialism since white supremacy was introduced to this land. Today, I interpret what the women say about their parents' actions is just part of that long legacy. I'd like to switch um, briefly and talk a little bit about transformational mentors. Again, some of these mentors have been already mentioned. Um, in earlier work, um, uh, Dr. Solorsona and I define transformational mentors as peers and adults who actively demonstrate a commitment to social justice and use their own experiences and expertise to help guide the development of others. A mentor is involved in a more complex relationship than a role model, so it's something more than just a role model, in that they are someone who participates in one socialization and development, one who actually participates in um, guiding young people to be woke. Uh, 
Um, and so there were adult transformational mentors that were mentioned. Um, clearly, um, one that um, Dr. Garcia outlined for us and many of us know about is Sal Castro. And so um, four or five of the women actually talked about Sal and what that meant. Um, Celeste, Paula, Mita, and Rosalinda all named him. And uh, during the blowout, Celeste was actually Sal's, um, they called it a student secretary then, like a student aide, um, for the period in which he taught a guidance class. And Celeste recalled how she was able to interact with Sal and the important influence he had on her. She says, I can't read this. I was working as his secretary at that time. I would listen to him and the class. And in that guidance class was where he would talk to his students about, you know, lack of quality education and so on and so forth. A guidance class was basically where you started to plan your future. And they would give you these little tests to see what you seemed to be, what your preference was. Was it clerical? Was it business? Was it going into science or whatever? And then after the test, he'd say, see, this is a bunch of bullshit. They're trying to track you into these different things. So, you know, I was listening to him also, and he's a very dynamic person. As a teacher, he was fantastic. And so this idea of transformational mentors being not just a role model, which Sal was a role model to many, because obviously he didn't have every student, but he was a transformational mentor in the sense that he interacted. He was shaping the way young people thought. Another student, another um, person who was mentioned Oops, let me get to here. Oh, another person who was mentioned was actually Mito Cuaron's father. Um, Celeste uh, mentioned that he talked to them uh, about things that were going on in the world, about their identity, um, some of the same types of things that people have said about Sal Castro. Um, there were also two other individuals that were named um, California politicians. They became politicians later, Richard Alatore and Marguerite Archie Hudson. Richard was a camp counselor and workshop leader at Camp S. Kramer, which many of the youth obviously went to. And Marguerite was the director of Upward Bound at um, Occidental College. Rosalinda recalled the type of mentorship she found in Marguerite's leadership style and in her personality and her behavior. She says, I remember how she opened up our minds too. I mean, she was so outspoken and she wasn't afraid of anybody. Why did administrators anybody? She wouldn't tuck and hush. I mean, she would just say openly what she thought, and she fought for it. She was such a marvelous, mar marvelous, courageous, outspoken woman, and so intelligent and so capable and ready to stand up and fight for what she believed in and express it openly. So again, over and over, these peer, these transformational mentors, but also peer mentors were talked about, and that becomes really important, I think, when we talk about some of the movements today. Um, three of the women talked about the important role their peers played. Celeste, Mita, Cassandra talk about the ways in which their friendships with certain peers kept them connected to social justice issues, including the blowouts. Celeste pointed out that through her friendships with Paula Crisostimo, uh, quite a few of the guys um, that were leaders, she would um, stay in the loop. She would be able to know what was going on. Rachel discusses the influence of two peers, Vicky Castro and David Sanchez, while she was in high school and names other friends that were influential to her, um, uh, to her involvement in college. She tells a story about um, writing an essay that you were supposed to write about a hero, and she wrote about David Sanchez, and it came back all ripped up by the teacher written in red that, like, this couldn't be a hero. She also talks about Vicky Castro and says... Uh, well, first of all, being female, and she was very responsible, and you couldn't help but love her. Vicky had a lot of tact and a lot of savvy and a lot of knowledge. So she was a, a, a few years older than the high school students, um, but she was a peer, and so the importance of that. It's clear that as young students, these women gained a social consciousness and to differing degrees embraced a critique of the educational system based on their relationships with transformational mentors, uh, adults or peers. The role of the adult transformational mentors points to the importance and the need today for cross-generational movements. These mentors can often add their experiences, expertise, resources, and or legitimacy to the cause youth take up. The role of peer mentors highlights the importance of recognizing and honoring the knowledge and expertise that is within our youth that Dr. gomez Quinone has talked about, youth uh, widely defined. We see the significance of this today in numerous movements, including the Dreamers Movement, Undocu Queer Movement, the Tucson, Arizona youth, um, young activists that inspire, guide, and lead their peers. 
This third category I talk about more in the paper, but I'm just going to really briefly touch on it here. And it's based on Emma Perez's, um, the way she theorizes the process of sitios y lenguas, as those sitios where decolonized lenguas can unfold. Well, she focuses on the spaces and the languages launched specifically by Chicana lesbians. Perez also points to the need for all marginalized groups to engage in the process of learning to speak and moving on from object to subject. She states, for me, marginalized groups must have separate spaces to inaugurate their own discourses, nuestra lang lengua en nuestro sitio. And so one example of that would be Sal Castro's classroom that was already talked about by Dr. Garcia. Um, the idea that it was a physical lo location, but it was a socio-political space that allowed young people to um, be exposed to certain kinds of discourses um, separate from kind of dominant discourses. And the women identified other spaces such as the community activist newspapers that were talked about earlier, Upward Bound, the Mexican-American Youth Leadership Conference that later became the Chicano Youth Leadership Conference. Each of these and other spaces that they named provided them with sitios y lenguas that allowed them to speak and move from, from object to subject. These allowed the young people to develop a consciousness and a critique of domination and to understand school inequities. They also gained an inner and collective strength, which became focused on transforming the schooling system in East L.A. And I think it should be noted that the processes of sitio de lenguas does not mean that the spaces and discourses are without fault or free from colonial and patriarchal influences. That's there. That was there, too. That is, at the same time that those spaces allowed students to examine inequities in schools based on race, ethnicity, and class, sometimes they um, also invoked heteronormative practices or patriarchal discourses. And so I think it's a constant struggle to think about how we develop these spaces for our youth today. Marginalized groups must continue to have separate spaces to inaugurate their own discourses, but, but, creative, but creating those spaces free from colonial or oppressive practices. It's an ongoing challenge. Many of the sitios de lenguas today are virtual. They're on social media, which has introduced new possibilities and new challenges. And so while social media is so much a part of the youth um, today, and there's a lot of negative, and I'm a parent of three teens, and I get that, there's also a lot of positive, and we see in some of the more recent movements how not having to use a mimeograph machine or not having to do phone calls um, can get the word out in very different ways, right? The last thing I want to talk about are some of the contradictions that came up. I mentioned the contradictions of, of getting mixed messages of, uh, uh, that were around gender. But another mixed message was, um, as I listened to the inner women's interviews, individual interviews, I heard a lot about this kind of dichotomy of how they were good girls. Many of them were the college tract. They were um, cheerleaders or student council reps. And so when we went back to the focus group, I kind of, tr and, and then they were seen as the bad girls. They were, they were the ones who walked out. They were punished, um, some of them, things like that. And so when I brought them back to the focus group, I tried to make sense of this dichotomy, um, looking through a Chicana feminist lens that very often says, yeah, there's this kind of um, virgen puta dichotomy of a good girl, bad girl. And the women came back and said, you're reading it wrong, Dolores. It was the response it wasn't what we were doing was good girl, and then we did things that were bad girl. We did the exact same things. It was how we were responded to that changed. And so I want to play you um, two different clips. One is from the 1996 interview, and it is Rosalinda Mendoza Gonzalez. And she um, articulated this, and then we continued to have a conversation, and, and, and all the women chimed in. So let me let you hear her from her words about this kind of contradiction in how outsiders, uh, not outsiders, um, sometimes it was family members, teachers, administrators, police, but how different people responded to them differently. You know, I, I don't see that as a contradiction. I think the things that made us see leaders before the lockdown, the things that made us succeed, were the fact that we really were doing things, we were scared about things, we took things very seriously, we worked hard at them, we spoke up in class, and that's why we were achieving, that's why we were elected to be officers uh, of club. So I think that when we stood up and spoke up for the things that we saw happen, I think it was in reality. I don't see what I normally did. I think what was the 
reality, but in the reaction, because if you're speaking up in class, you get a car. And you're speaking up to, you know, to run the speed about the office, you get a car, to the goal. But if you're speaking up on issues that the power structure does not like, then that's what happens in the day. So it wasn't that for us there was this contradiction, but the contradiction was in the way the very thing that they do, the very same principle that you stood up for, the way that they, that they were responding. So importantly, as she points out, the contradictions were not in the actions of the young Chicanas, but rather in the response to their actions. Society and educators more specifically usually want young people to be civically engaged. Enga they want them to be strong students, community leaders, committed to the founding principles of this country. In a system of patriarchy, they also wanted young girls to stay in their place. And yet when they did the things they were supposed to do, to get a better education, that's when um, some folks turned on them, educators and, and such. The last one I wanna play is actually, uh, last week, Cal State LA, uh, my campus um, held a two day event um, that was organized and um, directed by Dr. Octavio um, Villalpando. And it was a, um, a real success because the second day um, we brought in uh, a thousand high school students from LA Unified from the five legacy schools, as well as three of the smaller ones that have been built in more recent years to walk in instead of walk out, walk into campus. And so um, that was really exciting to have those students, Dr. Terrioso talked with them and they had breakout sessions with college students. But on the day before that was more campus students to a packed room, five of the eight women that I just introduced you to were present. And so it was wonderful to have them on stage and to have a dialogue about their memories, about what happened. And um, this is a clip that also points to contradictions, the contradictions and how Mita Cuaron was actually responded to based on what she did. Uh, again, her family were activists. Her family was the home that a lot of people, uh, a lot of students went to. They had their old mimeograph machine. And so she talks about, um, when we clip in here, she's actually talking about um, uh, the response and she, her father, and two other people who went to the principal's office and what, and what happened to them. And, and then what happened to her afterwards in terms of being suspended and, and police officers. And so the sheriffs came in and they arrested us. And they threw us on the floor and they handcuffed us. They yanked us down. Not even allowing us to walk, they were dragging us. The only weapon we had was my voice. And I screamed and I screamed, look at what they're doing to us, look at it. And the kids were looking out of the windows. I would be arrested, put into the Third Street Jail, and upon my release, I would be suspended. And when I returned to school, we had to face this brutal man again. I don't know what became of that meeting, but it was, you could cut it with a knife. But when I entered my one classroom, he was Mexican. He was teaching us history. And he stopped me dead in my tracks before I could enter the classroom. He said, oh, look who's decided to come back to class, you troublemaker. After you caused all this disarray, you decide to come back to my class? Well, you know what? I don't care what you do, because I'm going to fail you. And he did. This is a history teacher. Where's my constitutional rights? Where are they? I didn't even know I had any then. So what I'm finally going to say to you is, I happen to be so fortunate to be in that time, in that moment, to be caught up in our civil rights movement, that to see all of your faces makes me so proud that don't allow anybody to ever take our 
culture away, our history away, our voice away. Chicano power! She says, and looking out, looking at you, are the legacy, and it makes me so proud. What was really powerful is um, several of them are alum of Cal State LA, and they had told stories about when they first came to campus. It was, you know, a year or two, three years after the blowouts, and they would look for brown faces to kind of nod or find someone. Well, our campus looks very different now, and um, the room was full of probably 400 standing room only um, brown um, faces and so um, all the women's talked about being up on that stage and seeing how powerful um, that was. So today, 50 years later, lessons from the women who participated in the blowouts continue to be relevant to how we nurture current and future student activists. The women's words remind us that there are sometimes contradictions in nurturing activist imaginations. Mita's words specifically remind us that there's that the brave youth in Florida who are standing up against gun control are treated differently than the brown youth in 1968. And some would say, but the times have changed. But we can also point to that they're treated differently um, from a more affluent community. And they are brave, the youth in Florida, but they're from a more affluent um, community and they're being treated differently than the brown and black youth who stand up with Black Lives Matter um, who stand up for Mexican American studies in Tucson or against the Dakota Access Pipeline in Standing Rock. And so again, continuing to think about how do we nurture the imaginations, the actions of our youth today, knowing that there's contradictions and how they may be responded to. So thank you. These are the women after the panel, the five that were able to um, actually be there. <laughs>